Welcome. Thank you for coming to today's workshop on preparing effective resumes, CVs, and cover letters. My name is Monica Giorgini, and I'm a career educator at the Careers and Experience Office at Western University. Today's session will be about one hour, and we will look at how to make effective resumes, CVs, and cover letters to get the attention of employers. Sometimes it can be difficult to know what to put on a resume, but in this session, we'll discuss how to capture all of your amazing qualities on paper. We'll begin today by looking at the CV versus the resume, and then we'll move into the four essential elements of a good resume, followed by a look at cover letters, and then finally talking about services and available resources. So here's the brief uh, look at the, the two different documents. So on this side, we see a CV. It's a course of life. It's a summary of skills, experience, and education. Uh, lots and lots of details. It's often longer than two pages. And very typically, a CV is required to apply for graduate school or scientific research, academic positions, and occasionally uh, jobs. Although a CV is often used in other countries instead of a resume. On the right side, we see that a resume is a brief account of skills, experience, and education. The information is very concise, typically no longer than two pages, sometimes just one page, depending on the industry and it's generally prepared by an applicant for a job. Here's a chart showing the differences between those two documents, the CV and the resume. We'll see that uh, we've already talked about the audience. Typically, the CV is targeted towards fellow academics in your field of study, while the resume is targeted to employers who are hiring for a wide variety of positions. You can also notice that the CV typically contains more detail because of the nature of the positions being applied to. They're also, CVs are also used uh, when applying to graduate studies. And so this is a very common uh, situation where you would want to include any presentations that you've done and any research, uh, perhaps any publications that you've had as well. There are no specific guidelines for how you should organize your experiences or the information you choose to include. Uh, we have some ideas to, to share and we'll talk about how you might set this, uh, set up your, your uh, layout, lay out the information on your document in a little bit. But in fact, a lot of students today or a lot of people in general are exercising their creativity and developing their own CV styles to differentiate themselves from other candidates. So in looking at the different headings that you might choose to have on your CV, we see that there's some that are very common to both documents, such as education um, and experience and community involvement, but let's take a closer look at some of the other areas that you might not normally include on the resume. So awards and distinct awards, distinctions, or any fellowships, uh, scholarships that you may have received, for example. Research techniques, if you've done any research in your program and research interests. Publications and presentations that you might have had throughout your undergraduate career. You might want to list anything that you may have presented at uh, conferences or perhaps other important events, uh, publications if you've had anything published. Uh, you want to cite dates, um, titles of your events, obviously, and location. And you might want to use subsections within this area. So in terms of research experience, again, consider what relevant research you've done to date through any undergraduate studies that you might have done, um, uh, maybe special coursework during your programs that you might have completed, uh, anything in addition that you might be proud of that you completed during your, your studies. 
want to emphasize the novelty of, of your work, of your research, and any maybe special techniques that you used and how your findings may have been put to use. So also there's teaching experience if you've ever had opportunity to teach. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be on campus, by the way, either. It could be outside. Maybe you held a tutoring position, for example. Um, additional employment that you might have had. This is a, a great title to use if you are wanting to separate perhaps less relevant experience that you may have accumulated from the experience that you feel is more targeted to your current goal. So any courses that you've taken or special teaching expertise that you've gained, uh, maybe outside of your, your program, and also community involvement. Don't forget this is very important and employers always look to see this on, on a CV as well as a resume to see what you have done outside of the classroom, uh, additional experiential learning, for example, volunteer work, uh, serving on different um, other committees, um, belonging to other organizations, etc. Also, languages and references are other titles that you may wish to include. So to wrap up our discussion on CVs, ultimately, keep in mind both CV and resume must show that you are well suited for the position to which you are applying. The basics of resume writing also apply to your CV. The structure of a CV is flexible depending on your unique skill set and experiences. And also remember, other countries may prefer certain formats and may require additional information. So keep this in mind if you are applying to opportunities abroad. Now we'll shift our focus to the resume. I like this little comic. What do you mean? It's not a good resume. It's the most expensive one on eBay. In my work career, I've met with a lot of individuals who have paid good money for an expert to write a professional resume, one which they could never end up using because it didn't really represent them. So make sure that your document is an accurate reflection of who you are, because if this resume gets you in for a job interview, you will need to speak to it. So you want to own your resume and make sure that when you're developing it, you are able to validate all the information on there if you were asked to do so in the interview. Now we're going to delve into the four essential elements of an effective resume. It needs to be relevant and targeted, accomplishment-based, easy to read, and error-free. So resumes need to be relevant to the needs of the employer to whom you are sending it to. There is no such thing as a generic resume or a one-size-fits-all. You might hear on occasion of someone having success with this type of tool, but it is very, very rare. So only information relevant to the position you're applying for should be included. Some people are lucky enough to have lots of different experiences from many different areas of their lives, like employment, academics, volunteer activities, or perhaps they've had many different jobs, like a different summer job every year, or perhaps a number of different skills that they've accumulated, leadership skills, decision-making skills, teamwork, communication, etc. Your resume must be targeted or customized to a specific job. You don't have to rewrite your resume for every job you apply to. Sometimes small tweaks are enough. Thoroughly review the job description and identify which skills and attributes you want to align with the employer's needs. Your resume must reflect what employers are looking for in terms of qualifications, skills, experience, and attributes. Include keywords and appropriate skills and attributes that show you are the right fit. So just a bit more on uh, using the correct language. You want to include keywords and relevant skills, experience, and attributes to match the employer's requirements. 
and that means everything they've indicated on the job posting. Sometimes I'll have students ask me, well, isn't it just a given that I can communicate or isn't it just assumed that I can be part of a, a team? That, that might be one way of looking at it. However, I always say if it's important enough for the employer to indicate that on the job posting, they would expect that you include that information in your document and demonstrate how you demonstrate how you use those particular skills. You want the employer to see you as the ideal fit for the position ultimately. So ask yourself when you're writing your document, have I used all the keywords mentioned in the job posting or at least all the, the most important ones? Have I included all of my relevant skills and qualifications? Can I group my experiences better or highlight any reoccurring themes that might be important to the employer? Does my resume make it clear, make clear the type of job that I'm seeking? Now we're on to the guideline number two, accomplishment based. Your resume should have accomplishment statements rather than a list of job duties. I will say quite honestly that this is the part of resume development that most individuals I work with struggle. It can be difficult to write them at the beginning because it's not something we're used to doing. But once you get the hang of it, it will, it will become easier. So an accomplishment statement, it shows the employer, what skills you used, the actions you took to resolve a situation, and the outcomes of your work. And this outcomes piece is very important to them. They don't have to be earth shattering. They can be something simple. Be honest when describing your accomplishments and provide specific examples. The next few slides will make it more clear. And I have lots of great um, examples for you to look at. So use accomplishment statements that are relevant to the job requirements, highlighting how or when, why you did the task and the result that came from it. This chart nicely shows how you can move from a particular job title through, and we see here that uh, you were maybe a sales associate in one role. And these are some of the activities that you did in that role. Maybe you sold clothing to customers, perhaps you worked on the cash register, maybe you did some inventory, you did training sessions, you dealt with customer complaints, etc. So the actions you took um, might include that you were attentive to and assessed client needs or customer needs. Maybe you responded to client complaints complaints with tact and professionalism. So you're talking about how well you did it. Maybe you were friendly and outgoing when interacting with customers, coworkers, and managers. Perhaps you demonstrated accuracy and speed when using the cash register. Maybe you were flexible and you were always ready to fill in when you were asked. And perhaps you demonstrated initiative as well. So the outcome of your actions, perhaps the fact that you sold clothing to customers and you were attentive to their needs and, and be, being able to assess what they needed, this resulted in having repeat clients. Or perhaps you earned a reputation for superior inventory knowledge through your work on um, managing inventory. Perhaps your sales uh, was surpassed the monthly goals. Maybe you received accolades from your management. Maybe you were recognized by your colleagues for being the person to go to whenever they had a question or by customers uh, as being consistently friendly and helpful. Perhaps you were to ask to take on more responsibility. Why did this happen? What, what, did you dis what skills did you demonstrate to result in this kind of a request? So some of the, the skills and personal qualities that we see down this um, last row here, we see communication skills, interpersonal skills, customer service, teamwork, et cetera. We see these skills repeated over and over in job postings that we, that we come across. So hopefully this, this little chart is helpful in um, thinking about how you might move towards putting an accomplishment statement together.
So now we're going to go step by step in how to write an accomplishment statement. First, think of a time when you made a difference in your work, school, or community. Describe that difference in your methodology. Perhaps think of a time where you saved resources, time, or money for an organization, a team, or a club. You might want to quantify some of these accomplishments. Consider when you've received recognition or an award for a job well done. Describe your experience and what you were awarded for. Maybe think about times when you were involved in organizing events. What was the success and the outcomes? So now we're starting to put our thoughts together. What was the challenge you faced or the context of the situation you were faced with? Maybe there was a problem, an existing issue that you were needing to solve. What was the action you took? How did you respond to the problem? What skills did you use in managing that situation? What were the results that you obtained, the outcomes? What was the benefit of your actions? Who benefited from your actions? Maybe it was your, your clients that you were serving or perhaps your colleagues, maybe your company, your department. What were you able to accomplish qualitatively or qu perhaps quantitatively? Now we're moving towards putting all our thoughts together. Our challenge in this particular example was teaching English as a second language. So here we taught English as a second language lessons to children. Our action was utilizing creative activities and adapting communication style to the needs of each child. And the result of our work was resulting in improved test scores. So there you see how all these different parts fit together. Here are some more great examples. I'll let you have a few moments to read over them. You can see in some of them, you might begin with a skill action verb, and in others, you might invert it to show the outcome of your work first. You want to always consider using powerful skill action verbs to describe the actions that you took. You can often see these very same verbs in the job posting. Perhaps the employer is looking for facilitation skills or they want someone who is professional and courteous when dealing with customers. Or perhaps they're looking for someone with strong organizational skills or someone who's good at record keeping with accuracy. And a few more examples on this slide. In this case, we have three bulleted statements showing some quantification, something I had mentioned earlier that's nice to include in your document. effective skill action verbs to clearly show what you did in your role. Using strong action verbs add movement and life to your document. You may find other skill action verbs that you may want to use depending on the type of work you are targeting by doing a, an internet search using keywords such as effective skills for publishers or important skills for writers. And you will get some additional 
uh, information to give you some guidelines on what other words you might want to use in your document. I encourage you to practice writing accomplishment statements if you're not already familiar with these. As I mentioned earlier, this can often be the most difficult part of developing a resume or a CV because we're not in the habit of considering, considering the outcomes of our work as we're going about our day to day. It's important to become comfortable with writing these statements and the more you practice, the easier it will become. For one of your discussion posts with your professor, you'll have a chance to get some practice developing your own accomplishment statements. So now we're at guideline number three, easy to read. Your document needs to be easy for the reader to find the information that they're looking for to determine whether or not you will be a potential candidate. If your resume is hard to read and employers can't find the information they're looking for, they won't take the time to look for it. You can use effective font, spacing, formatting, and layout of your information to make sure that it is in fact easy to read. Consider the average time an employer takes to look over a resume is just six seconds upon that initial glance. So don't make the reader work to find the information. A few quick tips to find ways to declutter your resume. You want to use an organized layout and a strong visual order. You want to avoid distracting formatting such as oversized font, heavy lines or overuse of highlighting. You want to consider the visual center of the page and how recruiters read resumes. This is typically the upper third portion of the first page of your document. Make it aesthetically pleasing. Remember, six seconds is all they're taking upon that initial glance to determine whether or not they want to look further. It's often the form and not the substance of your resume that gets the most attention. If it's not well organized and neatly laid out, the reader may be put off from reading it. Just a brief mention about font here. There's some different examples shown on this particular slide. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, not any one of these is, is particularly um, preferred. You want to choose a font that's clean, easy to read, and appropriate for the available resume space that you have to work with. Fonts like Arial, Calibri, Verdana, as well as Times New Roman tend to work well. In terms of size, definitely nothing smaller than a 10 or 10.5 or no greater than a 12 typically. It really depends on the particular font you've chosen and again as I mentioned before the available space that you have. So now we're looking at the content and layout of the information on your document. Usually beneath your name and contact information, you will find a profile or summary section. This is where you list uh, your qualifications, uh, proven competencies, skills that are most relevant to the position that you're applying for. It helps to clarify your background to the employer in a quick snapshot. It's often considered to be one of the most important parts of your resume while they're doing that six second scan. And it's very important for your resume to act as a standalone document, especially in cases where a cover letter is not being used. So in this case, you want to add a few comments about your education, your experience, your skills, and anything else that you feel you have to offer that will make you stand out as the ideal candidate.
here we have a before and after shot of the objective statement. In this case, we have something that's really lackluster and not very helpful to an employer to obtain a position with a thriving organization where my skills and experiences will be effectively utilized. Not ideal because it doesn't really tell them anything. The qualifications are also, they're not bad, but they could definitely be better. They're basically listings of what you've done. Whereas in the after uh, shot here, we have an objective uh, to obtain a p the position of financial support officer within the Department of National Defense. Much clearer and to the point. In terms of qualifications, you can see here that you're not just mentioning what qualifications you have, but giving an indication of how they were demonstrated. Continuing on with what you might have in terms of content, we see some other major sections that you will have on your resume. So we have the education section, always important to show your education in reverse chronological order, including the month and the year of completion, your concentration, uh, the name of the school where you attended and your degree, relevant coursework or maybe advanced level classes showing key skills. In the experience section, this is where you will describe your work experience. It's always listed in reverse chronological order. You want to use strong action verbs, focusing on those accomplishments and using industry specific language. And you want to refer to the job posting as your guide. This is the section where you're going to be using all those great accomplishment statements that you've developed. Target appropriate keywords so that hiring managers don't have to guess. And some additional sections to consider, some headings, might include awards or achievements, professional development perhaps that you've taken, further courses beyond your degree, certifications that you've attained that might be important or shown in the job posting, relevant experience versus other experience. This is up to you to choose how you wish to show your experience and break it down. Also, don't forget those volunteer or extracurricular activities. There are different resume formats that you can use to lay out your information on your resume. There are three main ones, chronological, skills-based, and combined. First, we'll look at the chronological. It's the most common and traditional format it's been around for a long time. It shows your work experience in reverse chronological order, and that's where the emphasis is placed on where you worked, what dates you worked, and showing your experiences that align with those particular positions. It works really well if you've had years of related work experience or for an individual who is now looking at the going into the same field that they've accumulated a lot of experience in. A skills-based or functional style allows you to group your relevant skills and abilities together by skill type. It highlights the skills that match with the job posting and with this style it hides gaps in employments, employment and it's best for people who might have skills but not a lot of related work or volunteer experience. And the third format, of course, being the combined or hybrid. This one combines features of chronological and functional or skills-based formats. It allows you to pro promote your key credentials and positive qualifications, grouping these together under skill headings based on the particular skill areas that are relevant to the employer. And then within each of these skill headings, you will show your work experience. Of course, in reverse chronological order. We're going to look at some examples momentarily. And here we have the chronological format. Experience is listed in reverse chronological order. 
The dates are shown on the right side. And the location of the employer is also shown. Here we have uh, the General Medicine Unit of the University Hospital in London, Ontario. You want to keep in mind that you want to include the location of your employer, the city and the province. This depends on whether you have international experience, in which case then you would show the city and the country. And next we have the functional or skills-based format. Here we are highlighting our relevant skills and abilities under skill headings. For example, we have here leadership and teamwork. So these particular accomplishment statements are taken from various positions, um, which would be of course listed in a work history under a separate heading below where there you would include your position, the company name, the location and dates of employment. But you can see very clearly the focus is on the skills demonstrated, the skills and how they were demonstrated. And finally, in the combined format, this is our chance to highlight and organize our skills and experience in the most relevant way. There's a little bit of information at the top that we didn't show on the other ones, the education piece, but you could definitely include your, res your education in a similar way in those other two formats. But putting the focus down here on how you are representing your work experiences under specific skill headings. So we have customer service and communication skills. Obviously there would be other skill headings as well where you would list relevant work experiences. But in this case, we have the job title, we have where we worked, the dates on the right, and then one bullet showing an accomplishment statement while working in this particular role. And then the same again with the next listing. Just a few other considerations to help with the aesthetic appeal of your document. You want to make sure there's enough white space to avoid crowding. You want to have good spacing in your lines between sections and you want to maintain consistency throughout your document for a nice balanced look. In terms of font, the simple fonts that we talked about before, Times New Roman, Arial, Calibri, you want to be consistent throughout. Again, I mentioned the size earlier between, you know, roughly 10 to 12. You can, it's recommended that you put your name in a slightly larger font and then contact information perhaps in a slightly smaller font. And then for bullets, you want to use basic, nice round bullets, uh, punctuation. You can either have periods at the end. This is optional uh, at the end of your bullets, that is, but you want to be consistent throughout. And you'll aim to, tr to limit your bullets to maybe five or six per category or position. And again, this could be even as few as one bullet as was shown in the previous example um, at certain workplaces where maybe you don't want to put the emphasis on that particular experience, but you do want to show uh, one accomplishment. Your document must be error free. Bad spelling and grammar in a resume are near the top of the list for recruiters to reject it. They may think if you can't be bothered to check your resume for good spelling and proper grammar, you might do the same if you're hired. They might make you look lazy or careless, not the sort of qualities you want to portray to an employer. Always make sure to carefully read through your resume. Read it several times, read it until the next day so you look at it from a fresh perspective or perhaps consider having someone else look, at, look over your resume. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one but here, here's a quick look at a few inadvertent errors made by people because perhaps they relied on a spell checker. It looked good to a spell checker because it didn't know the context. You might want to use something like Grammarly, a free tool available online. You probably already know about it, or perhaps another tool that you may have used before to help with grammar and spelling. 
Again, proofreading is important. Make sure your document shows your best self. So in wrapping up on resumes, is there really such a thing as a perfect resume? Not one perfect format we can use or layout or style. There's so many variations, as there should be. We don't want to look like all the other candidates applying. Show some uniqueness while still maintaining a professional document. Follow the four basic elements that we reviewed earlier and speak to the requirements in the industry that you're targeting. Consider the employer's point of view. Now we'll spend some time focusing on the cover letter. Why do you need one? Well, it provides a positive visual first impression. It grabs reader's attention by showing your passion, personal associations, and unique contributions. Provides specific example, examples of your strengths and experiences that are targeted to the position. And it makes a connection between the physician's needs and the applicant's abilities. There are three basic cover letter guidelines, me, you, and us. Consider these three different sections. Begin with me. Outline how your qualifications meet the requirements indicated. Highlight your special skills and abilities relative to the employer's needs. Does that sound familiar? The same thing applies in your cover letter as you used in your resume. Next, the focus is on the employer, you. Demonstrate your knowledge. What have you learned about them? Employers are always very impressed when candidates show their initiative to learn about the company or organization. And lastly, there's us. In this section, demonstrate the fit between you and the employer, connecting their needs and your skills. Highlight your most significant accomplishments. Here we have the overall cover letter format. We have your name and contact information at the very top. This can be copied right from your resume so that you're using the same font and, and styling. You have your contact information. The date would follow. There's usually about two spaces between each of these sections. Then you would have, you would show the employer's name and mailing address as well as the employer's position, the salutation. If you know the name of the employer, then you would want to use their name, make sure to spell it correctly. If not, you can use terms like attention hiring committee or dear hiring manager or attention human resources. We recommend not using dear sir or madam or whom to whom it may concern because these are considered outdated. You want to re reference the position you're applying for in the opening paragraph. So here indicate why you're, why you're writing, how you've heard about the position, and why you're interested in it. You might mention something about your degree, um, your major, uh, where, where you attended university, and your graduation date in this section. Also, if you have a contact person that perhaps someone you spoke with uh, to learn more about the position, you might want to mention it here but we recommend only doing so if you've had their permission. So you'll be following these guidelines that I mentioned earlier, the me, you, and us in the following paragraphs before you get to the closing. To be honest, it doesn't really matter which order you put this in. I've seen it represented in different ways. It's an area where you can use some creativity. You want to use a positive tone throughout your cover letter, putting the emphasis on what you have to offer the employer and not calling any attention to what you might be lacking. Perhaps you're applying to a position where you're lacking some of the skills or requirements that they've indicated, but you still feel that you would be a strong candidate. In cases like this, focus on what you have to offer. In the final section or the closing, you want to thank the employer for considering your application and express your desire to meet for, a, for an interview in the near future. 
So then you would also have a complimentary closing like yours truly or sincerely. And then you can also include your name after that. And so for a recap, some key things to keep in mind. One page, no more than that. Keep it concise. You want to have a positive tone showing your confidence. And again, showing your research to, to demonstrate your initiative to learn about the company or organization. Elaborate on some accomplishments that you feel would be beneficial and important to the organization to which you're applying. Personalize your letter when possible by addressing it to an individual and always proofread. Another note to consider is nowadays cover letters aren't always requested. If that's the case, you don't need to send one. Look at the job posting carefully and see what it is the employer wants as part of your application documents and follow those instructions. And a few things that you don't want to do. You want to avoid repeating everything that's in your resume. In your cover letter, you have a chance to include information that perhaps wasn't on your resume. As I mentioned earlier, don't send a resume without a cover letter unless it's specified to do so. And obviously you're not going to use the same cover letter for every job because the cover letter is more personalized or tends to be more personalized. And avoid using sir or madam or to whom it may concern as these are not really used as salutations these days. Instead, as mentioned before, dear hiring manager or attention can be used inter interchangeably or attention hiring committee, attention HR, something along that line. And here are some great resources that you might want to look into. Uh, for further assistance, you can go to our website, career.uwo.ca. Uh, this particular link will take you right to the section on resume, CVs, and cover letters, where you'll find some um, great resources and, and examples. You may want to drop in to the Work or Western's Employment Resource Center. This is a great service. There's no appointment needed. They're available Monday to Friday, 10 to 4 in our office, UCC 210. Here you will meet with a career profile advisor who can provide you guidance and feedback. It's best to bring in your laptop uh, with whichever documents you wish to re re review. They'll also help with LinkedIn profiles and peer mock interviews. Although for the peer mock interview service, you do need to schedule an appointment uh, about two days in advance on Western Connect. CompleteStudent.ca is another resource that you can check out. And we mentioned Grammarly earlier for um, spell check and grammar, grammar checking. You can also feel free to use the internet to find out more resources. Sample job descriptions, for example, and job postings if you need to have more detail about skills important. And also lots of great examples for sep, uh, sample resumes and cover letters. If you're looking to meet with a, a member of our career education staff, you can schedule an appointment on Western Connect. It all begins with a 15 minute introductory appointment. And then beyond that, you're eligible to schedule longer appointments for about an hour as, as long as you need support. You're eligible for this service while you're a student at Western, as well as after graduation for one year.
Thanks for attending. Hopefully you've gained some insights on how to prepare effective resumes, CVs, and cover letters, and also learned a little bit about what services we can provide through our Careers and Experience office. If you'd like further assistance, please visit us, UCC 210, Monday to Friday. We're open 8.30 to 4.30. Or connect with us on social media.